Could I ask members who are leaving the chamber to do so as quickly and as quietly as possible, please? The final item of business uh, this evening is a members' business debate on motion 9705 in the name of Katie Clark on fire service cuts. Uh, the debate will be concluded without any uh, questions being put. I'd invite members wishing to participate to press the request to speak buttons uh, now or as soon as possible. And I invite Katie Clark to open the debate around seven minutes. Ms. Clark. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I welcome this opportunity to raise serious concerns currently facing the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. I thank all members who signed the motion which has enabled this debate to take place today and put on record my gratitude to the Fire Brigades Union Scotland for their briefings and tireless campaigning work. Last week, they published the Firestorm Report a state-of-the-nation report on the fire service, which almost 1,500 serving FBU members in Scotland participated in. It makes grim reading. Over the last decade, there has been a real terms 22% cut to fire service budgets. That amounts to around £64 million in real terms, going by the Scottish Parliament's inflation calculator. Over 1,200 jobs have been lost. That's around 15% of the entire workforce. And another 780 are at risk if the Scottish Government proceeds with the planned budgets, according to Chief Officer Ross Haggart when he gave evidence to the Criminal Justice Committee. And when you speak to firefighters, they tell of less firefighters on every shift and less available for each incident. They often speak of how there are delays when the first appliance has arrived and there are insufficient firefighters available to proceed to fight the fire or deal with the incident without acceptable risk. And so there are delays while they wait for more colleagues to arrive. The member give way? Yes, of course. Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful to Katie Clark giving way on that point. And isn't it right that the Scottish Government will say that the number of fires have gone down over recent years? But the reality is that this is the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. And recent inclement weather and floods have shown the importance of having a diverse, responsible fire service that can respond to the needs of the people. Katie Clark. The member is absolutely correct that the challenges the fire service faces with climate um, are going to be greater, yeah. but also, as I'll demonstrate in my contribution, the response times to incident have yes. been increasing yeah. as a result of the budgetary pressures. Mm. The number of available appliances across Scotland has also diminished, and the Chief Officer says that dozens of further appliances will have to be withdrawn if the current planned real terms cuts proceed. And many stations are in a state of disrepair due to the lack of adequate capital budgets. The impact of all of this is clear. Last year, it was revealed the average time to attend 999 calls was 8 minutes and 8 seconds, a significant jump from the 6 minutes and 50 seconds that was recorded as an average in 2013. This is far from the stated policy intentions set out when the service was centralised. In the policy memorandum, which accompanied the Police and Fire Reform Bill in 2012, it said the intention was not cutting frontline services. Chief Officer Ross Haggart has indicated that as a result of the flat cash budgets, the service will, re will be required to make savings of £36 million across the next four years to balance its budget. In September, second or third appliances were temporarily withdrawn from 10 fire stations across Scotland as part of an £11 million package of cuts for this year. The number of high-reach appliances was reduced and that means more risk. Since then, concerns have been raised about the increased time for high-reach appliances to attend incidents, for example, in air, East Cobride and elsewhere. 
Freedom of Information answers recently released to my office showed that full-time fire appliances were off the run, in other words, unavailable, £6,272 times in 2022, a 138% increase since 2019. In his evidence to the Criminal Justice Committee, Mr Haggett told us that if further cuts proceed next year, they may have to reduce the number of appliances by a further 17%. Firefighters themselves have also had a pay cut of about 12% in real terms over the last 10 years. We know these workers put their lives on the line for us. Earlier this year, firefighter Barry Martin died as a result of injuries sustained in the Jenners fire. Research shows that firefighter cancer rates are 1.6 times higher than the rest of the public due to the exposure to dangerous contaminants. And yet, in many cases in Scotland, firefighters don't have adequate spaces to wash or adequate equipment. In the Firestorm survey, many firefighters say they only have access to baby wipes after incidents. Several describe, decam decam several describe decontamination as the biggest issue for staff, with others admitting they're extremely worried about their health. The Scottish Fire and Rescue Service have a duty of care to their employees and a duty to provide safe systems of work. I understand that the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service is currently working on guidelines and would ask the Minister to provide an update to ensure the service is meeting its legal obligations as an employer. Research by my office found three quarters of stations are assessed as being of bad or poor suitability. Indeed, not a single station in the region that I represent is assessed as good. Tackling these issues will take sustained investment, and yet there is already a capital backlog of £630 million. The fire service has faced a decade of cuts. Response times have increased, and the Chief Officer says that will continue to increase uh, if these proposed cuts go ahead. The Scottish Fire and Rescue Service is failing in its duties to provide a safe system of work as an employer. I call upon the Scottish Government to bring forward an emergency funding package. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ms Clark. We now move to the open debate. There's a lot of interest in this evening's debate, um, so I'd be grateful if members could sit broadly to their time allocation. I call first uh, Stuart McMillan to be followed by Sharon Dowie, around four minutes. Mr McMillan. Thank you very much, Mr. Singh. I also first want to commend Katie Clark for securing uh, this debate. And since the changes were announced earlier this year, I've been contacted by many people across the constituency, including serving and retired Scottish Fire and Rescue Service officers, FBU members, and also members of the public. And like all people who have contacted me, I was concerned about the changes being proposed and also now enacted. I'm going to focus my, my comments on my own Greenock and Inverclyde constituency, and I share the FBU's concerns with regards to the Greenock Fire Station. Now, following the announcement of the proposals, I wrote to the Chief Officer Ross Haggart, along with a few MSP colleagues. I met with the Area Commander David McCarry, met with serving FBU members and retired Scottish Fire and Rescue Service members, and also most uh, recently attended a meeting organised and attended by the Minister uh, with the Assistant Chief Officer David Farris. I have listened to what each person has had to say and also read intently the written correspondence I have received. And while I understand that the SFRS rationale for removing the aerial rescue pump and replacing it with a dedicated high-reach appliance at the Greenwich Fire Station, I don't agree with it. Uh, it was explained to me that the aerial rescue pump is deployed often, but used infrequently. Now, that may be the case, however, I feel that when the dedicated high-reach appliance is deployed and is needed to fight a fire from above, this will require a pump to supplement this. Now, I also have concerns about there being a greater reliance placed upon the retained crews and their appliances. The Parliament this afternoon debated the Rural and Islands Action Plan. Saying also, Inverkitt and Meansbury are two villages in the southwestern part of my constituency, and they are covered 
by the retained crews from the Gurk in my constituency and also Skelmerley, the latter being in Kenneth Gibson's Cunningham North constituency. And for context, there are proposals to build 650 new properties on the site of the old Inverkip power station site. I do not support that proposal, as I believe it will have a long-term detrimental effect upon Inverclyde's economy. And this alongside the 400 additional homes to be built at Spangle Valley, which I do support, as it already has a railway station on site, will increase the future challenges for the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service's retained crews, in addition to the full-time crew uh, in the Greenock station. Now, I did pose the question when we had the, the meeting that the Minister hosted, when I did pose the question to the Assistant Chief Officer uh, during that meeting that if the Scottish Government were to give the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service extra money today, it would they use this to reverse the recent changes in the stations, including Greenock? Now, the answer was no. The money would be used to invest in and modernise the service, as he states that these changes are not about saving money. So that told me that this clearly indicates that the decisions that have been taken are taken by, as an operational matter and are not decided by the Scottish Government. Now, following the meeting, I responded to the FBU setting out uh, my position, and the response I received from the FBU agreed that there is need for modernisation, but the point was made that if the extra money would not lead to the, uh, quote, temporary uh, changes being reversed, they are, in fact, not temporary. That is something that I hope that the Minister can address in her comments. Uh, from the, my conversations with the serving Scottish Fire and Rescue Service officers, both recently and over my 16 years as, a, as an MSP, that the service was working well to reduce fires through the increased preventative work. I am saying also there are 11.3 firefighters per 10,000 of the population in Scotland compared to 6.1 in England. And between 2011 and 2012, and 2021-22, the number of recorded fires in Scotland dropped from 32,339 to 27,771. 27 That's a 14.1% reduction. Now, this demonstrates the role of a fire and rescue service in keeping my constituents and the people across Scotland safer. However, in the eyes of some members of the public, there might be the perception that there is less need for personnel or appliances due to the reduction in fires. I do not agree with that. I want the preventative work to increase, as I believe it has contributed to a reduction in fires. Also, in conclusion, the Assistant Chief Officer told me that he was comfortable with the level of cover that we have in Inverclyde. Uh, I am in no way questioning his belief when he said this, but I am also in no way questioning the position taken by my local officers who have shared their concerns. Uh, I firmly believe that our emergency services are critical to community safety, and I want to thank every single one of them for their actions and help them keep my constituents and everyone else in Scotland safe. Thank you. Thank you, Mr McMillan. I now call Sharon Dowie to be followed by Richard Leonard around four minutes. Uh, Ms Dowie. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you to Katie Clark for securing the debate. We owe our gratitude to brave emergency workers who put their lives on the line to protect us. When incidents like the recent blaze at Air Station Hotel occur, firefighters step up to keep us from harm. They deserve our thanks and as much support as possible from the Scottish Government. Ms Dowie, could you just move your microphone up just a little bit, please? I was pleased to meet with firefighters locally at both Ardrossan and Air Stations to talk to them about the work they do, offer my support and make sure they know how valued they are. The fire at Air Station Hotel is just one incident where Scotland's fire service came to save the day. But there are so many others happening all the time, from house fires to road traffic accidents to industrial incidents. Imagine how much worse these situations could turn out if we did not have such brave frontline officers, or if there were not enough of those brave frontline officers, or if they did not have the equipment that they needed, or if they had to wait for specialist appliances to come from far away or if they were operating out of crumbling stations. Unfortunately, we do not have to imagine those situations because they are happening right now. SNP cuts have left Scotland's fire service on its knees. And you do not have to take my word for it. You just need to read the recent Firestorm report. Response times to incidents will inevitably get worse. And why? Because firefighters no longer have the resources they need. 
The recent firestorm report from Fire Brigade's union revealed a service in crisis. It found we are already down 1,200 firefighters under the SNP, and in the next few years... Absolutely. Minister. Um, thank you for taking the intervention. I'd just like to ask if the member acknowledges that the £36 million savings that is based on the assumption of inflation pay increases is from the resource revenue, which is predicted for the next five years, and it is not the actual budget. Sharon Dowie. The Scottish Government have got the biggest block grant that they've ever had, and it's their political choice where they want to go and spend that money. So when they're doing the budget, we need to make sure that the fire service is suitably funded. In the next few years, the service could lose nearly 800 more jobs. We hear a lot of comparisons between Scotland and the rest of the UK, but as the FPU pointed out, and I quote, the FM's comments regarding firefighters per head of population fails to recognise the divergence of risk across the home nations. In 2021-22, which is the latest data set, Scotland suffered 5,068 fires per million of population, a significantly higher level of fire incidents than Wales at 3,456 and England at 2,702. A decade of underinvestment means that it would now cost 800 million to bring stations and the wider infrastructure up to the required standard. The FBU report found morale is at a terrible level as firefighters struggle to cope with the scale of the SNP cuts. Firefighters are dealing with the consequences of this in their daily work, but all of us could easily suffer the consequences of these cuts too. Any one of us could be trapped in a nightmare situation and need their help. We don't often think those moments will happen, but when they do, we all want to know that the fire service will be there to protect us, that there will be enough firefighters with the resources and the equipment to ensure our safety and that they reach us quickly. If the SNP keep on this path of cutting fire service budgets every year, then there is no doubt it will increase the risk to public safety. No matter the amazing efforts that firefighters go to, these cuts will increase the danger of accidents and unfortunate incidents. So I urge the SNP government to think again and reverse cuts give firefighters the support they deserve, invest in the service so it can be there to protect people when trouble strikes, and put public safety high on the agenda and make sure in an emergency our frontline services can respond swiftly. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Richard Leonard to be followed by Maggie Chapman in around four minutes. Mr Leonard. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I say to Katie Clark, thank you for your tenacity and determination in once again raising the grave concerns, not least on public safety grounds, of the cuts being inflicted on the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. And can I say to Siobhan Brown that the policy of the Scottish Government, of which you are a minister, was to remove the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service from local democratic accountability. That was the policy. That was the political choice. So you cannot turn up in Parliament and plead that you are not accountable, that these are operational matters. You are the only line of democratic accountability which is left to the people we represent, and that is the choice of your government, so you cannot wash your hands of it. Through the chair, Mr Leonard. The Fire Brigade's Union's outstanding new report, Firestorm, reminds us that when the single fire service was created, the Scottish Government promised that it was about, I quote, stopping duplication of support services and not cutting frontline services. But that is precisely what we are witnessing today. So let no one try and tell us that these are operational choices, they are political choices. The political choice to impose a disastrous flat cash settlement on Scotland's fire and rescue service. The political choice over the last decade to cut in real terms the fire service budget by 22%. The political choice with the result that over a thousand jobs have been axed, another 800 are now at risk 
and the retained duty system is in crisis. So when we are told that the removal of high reach appliances is about a modernisation of the service, we don't believe it. When we are told that the removal of appliances is temporary and not permanent, we frankly don't believe that either. We see it for what it is, another attempt to subvert then sidestep the democratic process. So I say to the Minister that we are not having it. The fire crews, like those I met at the Hamilton station recently, they are not having it. Their trade union is not having it. And our communities are not having it either. And then there is the IT system catastrophe. In recent months, I've taken up with the Minister the reckless waste of public money on a new command and control IT system for the service with a value of over £12 million. I've been told that these are also operational matters, but at least £1.7 million has been squandered in milestone payments for a system that was first ordered in June 2014, supposed to have been delivered in March of this year, but which was scrapped in December of last year. And now over £18,000 has been spent on external legal fees alone. With next to nothing to show for it except for mounting legal costs, this is a failure on a monumental scale, and the government is asking us to place our faith in the same people who now want to cut back on appliances. I know that the Scottish Government will blame Tory austerity for much of this, and they have a point. But whatever Jeremy Hunt announces, this Parliament has in train a process of setting our own budget, a budget of over £40 billion. So this evening, I call on the Minister for Victims and Community Safety to do your job, protect our communities, keep them safe, stand up for your department, stand up for this service, listen to what is being spell spelled out by the Fire Brigades Union, fight your corner and let some decisive political leadership before it's too late. Thank you. I now call Maggie Chapman to be followed by Stephen Kerr. Uh, up to four minutes, please, Ms Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and my thanks to Katie Clark for securing this evening's debate. Before I begin, I want to apologise to you, Presiding Officer, to Katie Clark and to the Chamber. I'll have to leave very shortly after speaking this evening, but I am glad to be able to participate, and I'm grateful to the Presiding Officer for his understanding. In my role as Justice Spokesperson for the Scottish Greens, it has been a huge privilege to work closely with members of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service and the FBU. I'm grateful to all of those personnel who have spent time with me talking about the service, showing me around different fire stations and teaching me so much about what they do, the vital, life-saving work they do. I never fail to be inspired and uplifted by the commitment they show to their work, to each other and to the people they serve. Because our firefighters, fireys as we affectionately know them, are among the most trusted public sector workers in Scotland. They are welcomed into our homes and communities. We trust them to keep us safe. So I say thank you to all our fireys and operators. Thank you for being there when we need you. Thank you for your commitment to your work. Thank you for walking into danger when most of us would choose to run away. Thank you for being on the phone talking to us when our worst possible nightmares are happening in front of our eyes. We owe our Scottish Fire and Rescue Service personnel our lives. We've heard from others already this evening that the service is already under strain, with too many appliances off the run, shifts not being fully covered, watchers having to travel further afield to support other stations, more and more of this happening than ever before. Longer response times, low staff morale, stress at work, and more. In conversation with fireys, I've heard so many stories of near misses, things that nearly went wrong with tragic consequences, but didn't, just. Thanks usually to their ingenuity, commitment, and dedication. These near misses do not feature in the modeling or statistics that the service has undertaken or provided. They aren't captured in the data but they are very, very real. 
I also know that the service is having to adapt to deal with the increasing risk and severity of wildfires and floods due to climate change. We've seen the realities of this so clearly in recent weeks and months. And earlier this year, I led a debate on the FBU's decon campaign, the campaign to raise awareness and get action to ensure our firefighters can decontaminate effectively after instance so they do not put themselves or their friends and family at increased risks of cancer, heart attack, and other diseases and conditions. And I commend Professor Anna Steck for her excellent and ongoing work on this. Firefighting is a carcinogenic profession and we need to treat it as such. One part of the service that is not often talked about are the control operators. People might not know this, but these operators will stay on the phone with callers while they wait for firefighters to arrive at an instant, for as long as it takes, even if that means the worst outcome for the person on the phone. All of this is taking its toll on the mental and physical well-being of our fire service and, and staff. All of this puts pressure on already stretched resources, and the service does need to evolve and adapt to deal with new challenges and threats. But service redesign and resource allocations have to be done in collaboration, in partnership with those on the front line. We should not have to wait for a disaster or tragedy to happen to ensure they have the resources they need to do their job safely and effectively. Instead, we must, we must invest in our fire and rescue service. I was proud to host the launch of the FBU's Firestorm report last week. And I urge the Minister to heed the warnings in that report, because they are warnings. We owe our firefighters and the communities they protect nothing less. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Chapman. And I call Stephen Kerr to be followed by Claire Baker in four minutes. Mr Kerr. Well, I congratulate Katie Clark on her motion, which I was pleased to sign. And I am delighted she brought this motion to the Chamber. And I nearly agree with everything that my old sparring partner, Richard Leonard, had to say in his, uh, as usual, energetic and uh, convincing speech. Um, the reality is that the governments are responsible for the difficult business of setting spending priorities. That's a reality. And before we hear rebuttals from the front bench about, you know, if you're going to take money from spend more money here, you've got to take it from here. That same old tired argument we get from nationalist and green ministers continually. The reality is that the public expect the government to set true priorities. They expect the government to do the right thing by them. And despite the wider claims, welder claims, of members in this chamber, there, there will always be greater demands on public spending than governments have the resources to satisfy. Because there is no bottomless pit of money, and to suggest otherwise is to be fundamentally dishonest with the public. But I say again, the public rightly expect governments here and at Westminster to do what is right based on the information available to ministers. Now, government is about making difficult challenges. Uh, taking on difficult challenges and uh, to stop pretending they don't exist. And we don't negate the fact that the government has to make difficult decisions, but the way that the SNP and Green Ministers bleat on about how difficult it all is, I wonder whether they haven't grown tired of being in the business of government and making those tough decisions. They certainly come across as a government that has run out of steam completely. See, fundamentally, uh, presiding officer, I believe that the first duty of government is public safety. And sensible spending priorities begin with the basic obligation of public safety, properly funding and investing in essential public services, and that means the blue light services, the first responders, the people who are there to protect life, to save life, and put their own lives on the line to serve us all. So why does this government refuse to prioritise these services. We have senior officers in the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service telling us that the service is catastrophically underfunded. Yet all we have heard, last week, for example, 
in First Minister's questions. The First Minister claiming that he and his ministerial colleagues know more about what is happening inside the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service than the people who work in that service. This is the same ignorant dismissal that is given in response to the voices of concern raised in the other essential services that the public expect us to properly fund, most notably Police Scotland and the Scottish justice system, all of which are in crisis. Stuart McMillan. Uh, I thank Stephen Kerr for taking the intervention and uh, surprisingly, I actually agree with Mr Kerr on his point regarding putting more money into the emergency service. It's probably the first time that him and I have agreed on something uh, in the time of Parliament. However, uh, there's also the point, going back to his earlier comments about governments have got to take difficult decisions and spending priorities, what budget would he take money from to put more money into, uh, into that particular area? Stephen Kerr. Well, I think I have agreed with Stuart McMillan on other issues. He's being somewhat uh, ungenerous in what he says. But I, I, but I have to say to him, he's brought out the same old tarred line about how difficult it is to be in government. If you can't stand the heat of the kitchen, you get out of the kitchen. If you can't be in government to make governmental decisions and to set priorities, get out of ministerial office, because that is why you get paid the big money to make these decisions. And there have been, frankly, too many examples of ministers in this government in recent weeks of uh, dismissing, lightly dismissing, the right con the concerns that uh, people are raising about the state of our public services. Now, I think, in fairness, I have run out of time, but look at the example of what the SNP has done to the Fire and Rescue Service. Just a snapshot of that report that's been quoted quite a few times and the reflections of colleagues. And by the way, well done, Katie Clark, on uniting all of us, I think, in all the parties, in demanding that the government sit up and pay attention and do something more to fund our essential public services. Fire stations closing, tenders being withdrawn, staff not being trained adequately, response times stretching dangerously, morale in decline. None of this is sustainable. So it's time for this SNP government to prioritise the national interest and not their nationalist interest. Thank you. I now call Claire Baker to be followed by Jamie Green in four minutes, uh, Ms Baker. Um, thank you, President Officer. Can I thank my colleague Katie Clark for bringing this important debate to the Chamber and also thank her for a comprehensive description of the state of Scotland's Fire and Rescue Service. Um, I don't have time uh, this afternoon to address the issues of the capital backlog or the health and safety of firefighters, so I will focus on the recent changes that have been introduced uh, to the fire service in my area. The motion itself highlights the temporary withdrawal of appliances, a description that is used by the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, and it's one which the First Minister also referenced last week in the Chamber. But in my conversation with those within the fire service, it's clear this is not the case, and the continued claim that it is temporary is at best a misunderstanding and at worst it is disingenuous. Because what is happening to the withdrawal of appliances during this temporary period? Are firefighters who have relocated as a result of appliance withdrawals, including compulsory transfers doing so on a temporary or a permanent basis. Describing these changes as temporary has allowed the changes to happen very quickly. A change as significant as this would require a consultation, but the scale of the budget cut has required immediate reductions to capacity. The public will only be consulted on the changes if there is an intention to make them permanent, and it is anticipated that that will happen. But what is being done to assess the impact of these changes ahead of that? The erosion of funding for Scotland's Fire and Rescue Service over a number of years brings us to this point. The case for, this, for the shift to a single service in 2013 was that it would protect the front line. But since then, we've seen massive job cuts, slower response time and changed conditions of service. The policy aim of a single service was to protect and improve local services despite financial pressures. Can the Scottish Government really argue that that has been delivered? In Mid Scotland and Fife, we have seen second and third appliances removed at Methyl, Glenrothes, Perth, and Dunfermline, while Kirkcaldy's height appliance was withdrawn literally hours after it was deployed, deployed to respond to a fire at former Kitty's nightclub at the start of September. And after this serious incident, are we really supposed to accept that it's no longer necessary to have this appliance? Across my region within the past 12 months has been a number of larger fires, including at the New County Hotel and Shore Recycling Centre in Perth, at Kitties in Kirkcaldy and the Pound Stretchers on Leaven High Street. 
The fire at a block of flats in Logelli earlier this month was devastating for residents and for the local community. Thankfully, all those who were in the flats were able to get out safely, but their homes have been ruined and their lives have been turned upside down as a result. This dreadful fire demonstrates the vital importance of the fire service in keeping our communities safe, but it also underlines concerns about changes to the service. To extinguish the fire, a high-rise platform from Dunfermline was deployed, now the only such appliance there is in Fife, with an additional height appliance having to be brought from outside the region. And while the fire service states that appliances attending high-rise incidents have always been sent from multiple stations, the removal of the local appliances from Fife will have an impact, whether in terms of response times or in the remaining cover for the surrounding area. And we saw this when the fire happened in Logelli, when another fire then took place in Leven, and because all the crews were in Fife dealing with a very serious fire in Logelli, a crew had to be sent from Dundee to go to Leven. Assessment work earlier this year found the time taken for second appliances to respond to emergencies would be two minutes and 40 seconds longer for urban areas in Fife. But we know that for those who are trapped in a fire and needing rescue, every one of those seconds will count. And this delay also puts increased pressure on the first responder appliances and the firefighters who are having to make urgent decisions about what their response will be. From speaking to those on the front line, it is clear that the changes already made have put them under additional pressure to carry out what is already a very difficult job. But if we continue in the same way, it will only get worse. I am urging the Scottish Government to listen to those on the ground and to improve the funding settlement urgently. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Baker. As I indicated at the outset, there is a great deal of interest in this debate. I am conscious of a number of members who still wish to participate. So I am minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 8.14.3 to accept a motion without notice and invite Katie Clark to move such a motion. I move, presiding officer. The question is that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And on that basis, I can now confidently call Jamie Green to be followed by Mercedes Villalba up to four minutes, Mr Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I thank Katie Clark for bringing this debate to the Chamber and also to the FBU for their Firestorm report. Uh, when I attended their event last week in Parliament, I spoke to some of their uh, reps from the Union. He seemed a bit surprised, perhaps, to see me. He said, we don't often get folk from your benches uh, around here. But I want to be clear to him and all of his members that he has perhaps an unlikely friend on these benches. Because let me assure them, every one of them, that we will always stand up for their hard work and their sacrifices to our constituents, uh, no matter what our politics and differences may be. Um, of course, the issue that we're debating today primarily stems from the issue of capital underinvestment over a prolonged period of time. And that's not a new issue. We've been talking about that for a long time in here. It didn't become a 600 million plus uh, backlog overnight. It took many years of chronic underinvestment. I think the government acknowledged that. We had a debate earlier this year where we spoke about the decon issue which Maggie, Maggie Chapman brought to the chamber. We spoke about the horrendous situation in which many frontline firefighters are in. The lack of basic facilities to shower, to clean, fresh water, uh, lack of facilities for female firefighters, uh, the inability to decon properly and the toxins that they're taking home to their families. It's all unacceptable. And we all agreed it was unacceptable at the time. The then Minister for Public Safety, I think, to her credit, acknowledged that and understood that that level of underinvestment had gone on for some time. When we grow the Minister further on the budget, on the potential for a flat cash settlement for four years, if that was a real uh, potential scenario, she made clear to us, and I quote, the current level of funding will be protected. But the problem is, is it hasn't been. Because if it had been protected properly, we would not be having this debate tonight. We'd all be in the garden lobby having a glass of wine. The firestorm report which the FBU brought to us would not have been required in the first place had those budgets been protected. Far from being protected. Far from being protected. We're now seeing impossible decisions now masquerading themselves as operational matters for the fire service. Operational in the sense that they're having to do it. Why do we know they're having to do it? Because committees of this parliament grilled fire chiefs year after year about the consequences of what a flash flat cash settlement would look like. Look, I don't disagree with anything that I heard in Stuart McMillan's speech when he spoke about his concerns about the Greenock station. I share many of his concerns. Where I don't agree, however, is that the difference of what extra cash would actually do in making amends. We know that because interim chief fire officer Ross Haggart told 
me and this committee when asked what the flat cash settlement would actually look like in real terms. His response was worrying. It was worrying to the committee and it should be worrying to us even yet today. In his own words, after a four-year period of flat cash, he said that about 25% of the whole-time firefighting establishment would probably become unaffordable by the end of that four-year period. And that is also taking into account 5% pay rises for the next two years. So what I would say to the minister is, we're not asking for money for the sake of it. The devastating consequence uh, that capital underinvestment has is the removal of appliances, it's the removal of retained full-time positions, it's the lack of training, it's the lack of investment in important upgrades, upgrades from stations, it's all of that. It's not just about pay rises, pay rises are important. The money has to go to the infrastructure, and if the money's not spent, then years down the line, that 600 million become a billion very, very quickly, and no government on earth is going to find a billion pounds down the back of their sofa these days. The local effect that has on each and every one of our constituents is worrying and it's devastating. It's not a political point we're making. This is the view of the firefighters themselves. They told us this. It's all on the report. I read it page by page, cover to cover. I hope the minister did too. We cannot ignore them. We cannot ignore them because all our blue light services are there for when we need them. We should be there for when they need us, presiding officer. Thank you, Mr Green. I now call Mercedes Vialba to be followed by Pam Gosal and in four minutes, Ms Vialba. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to start by thanking Katie Clark for securing tonight's important debate on the subject of fire service cuts. Like many others in the Chamber, I'm compelled to speak tonight out of alarm over reports that the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service has ordered the temporary withdrawal of fire appliances at 10 stations across Scotland. One of these appliances is set to be removed from Kingsway East Fire Station in Dundee in my region. And although these changes are reportedly temporary, firefighters and their trade union, the FBU, know all too well how easily temporary solutions become permanent. So like them, I'm extremely concerned by these proposals. I fear the impact they will have on my constituents and the significant risk to both firefighters and the public that these changes will cause. Presiding officer, I also fear the impact that a reduction in appliances will have on staff numbers, staff whose essential skills and expertise could then be lost from the service forever. We know recruitment and retention are already an issue within the fire service, which has lost 1,100 firefighters in the last 10 years. And according to the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service's own financial projections, a further 780 job losses are still to come. Fewer firefighters mean longer response times and greater risk to both the public and firefighters responding to emergency incidents. And in the event of any major incident in Dundee, there is very real concern that there simply isn't the cover needed to keep our firefighters safe and protect the public. So it's simply not good enough to refer to appliances elsewhere because mobilising appliances from other stations has an impact on the service's ability to respond quickly and it could leave those other areas vulnerable. So we simply cannot allow further cuts in this emergency service to be taken. It is imperative that the Scottish Government provide immediate and sustained investment in the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service to enable it to retain all 10 appliances and maintain the personnel required to staff them. But when I wrote to the Minister for Victims and Community Safety to urge her to act, she was unwilling to meaningfully engage, stating that, quote, operational decisions on the number and location of appliances are entirely a matter for the SF SFRS board and chief officer, end quote. But these operational decisions don't take place in a vacuum, Minister. They take place within the context of budgets, and it is her government that sets the fire services budget. 
Presiding officer, this summer, the SFRS published their organizational statistics for 2022 to 23. These statistics show several concerning trends which further highlight the impact of shrinking budgets and firefighter numbers. And that report doesn't even include the further cuts which have taken place over the course of the summer. So let's be clear. The problems facing the fire service are the result of chronic underfunding over a sustained period. The service has been operating with a massive double-digit cut in real terms in its budget over the last 10 years, which is why it's in the position it is now. The Scottish Fire and Rescue Service is an emergency service. It requires urgent investment from the Scottish Government, not cuts. So I stand with firefighters, I stand with the Fire Brigades Union, and I stand with the public, and we are saying stop the cuts. Thank you. I now call Pam Gozel to be followed by Monica Lennon in around four minutes. Ms Gozel. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am honoured to contribute to today's important debate on fire service cuts. And I thank Katie Clark for bringing this matter forward for members' business. As we have heard from across the Chamber today, fire services play a vital role in keeping our communities safe by responding to emergencies and providing medical assistance. They are always there when we need them most protecting lives as well as property. I think we all recognise that they often go far beyond their duty. In my community, they play a huge role in water safety and rescue teams. In East and West Dumbartonshire, we have 45 stations with 460 officers and 120 volunteers, all of whom are truly community safety advocates. Just this year, I was lucky enough to attend a Clyde Bank Fire Station Open Day. There, I met some of the real-life superheroes in our community from the west of Scotland. There were also Army cadets in attendance with their vehicles and the ambulance service, as well as members of the community. All in all, it was a fantastic day and, a perfect, and perfect for educating the community. There are lots of activities for people to watch and get involved with, including fire engines with water hose displays, fundraising activities, as well as live chip pan fire display, which caught the attention of everyone at the event. It was great to hear about the impressive multi-agency approach to school education. And the timing could not have been more appropriate. In West Dumbartonshire, more than 170 deliberate fires have been recorded in this year so far. That figure is already more than the annual figure in 2022. Play areas, school grounds and nurseries were among the sites being targeted. These are areas that our children play in and we expect them to be safe. While this while this open day certainly raised community awareness about the dangers of fire, it also showed everyone the risk our fire service personnel take every day just to protect us. Just as the motion outlines, they deserve to be well equipped, well resourced and well protected and well paid to do the job that they do. But we know that the SNP has cut the service's budget to the bone. The Scottish Fire and Rescue Service is expected to receive a flat cash budget settlement from the SNP over the next four years. A flat cash settlement will see the fire services have to make millions of pounds worth of cuts, which the Firefighters Union has warned will threaten the lives, the livelihoods and the homes of everyone in Scotland. And all we need to remember they are and we need to remember they are already stretched to breaking point. The number of personnel is down, levers are, levers are on the rise, attacks on service personnel are up, the number of vehicles at their disposal are down, the majority of buildings that are, are assessed are being of bad and poor suitability, and there is a huge backlog in the service. Uh, services capital investment. In conclusion, presiding officer, I am delighted to have had the opportunity to outline why the fire and rescue service is vitally important to my community. 
Quite the opposite of the SNP cuts, our fire service needs to see significant investment. They risk their lives every day to protect our communities and make them a better, safer place to live. I urge the Scottish Government to provide a fair funding deal for our fire and rescue service and return to negotiating table with unions as soon as possible so that the lives, homes and livelihoods of Scots are not put at risk. Our fire and rescue service deserve better treatment than this. Thank you. I now call the final speaker in the open debate, Monica Lennon. Around four minutes, please, Ms Lennon. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am grateful to my Scottish Labour colleague, Katie Clark, for securing this debate. And from listening to Ms Clark and the other speakers, I think it is very clear why this debate is so necessary. I am also grateful to Maggie Chapman for hosting last week's FBU Scotland event which did indeed launch the, the Firestorm report. For me, Firestorm is more than a report. It is a call to action, and government must act. The truth is that firefighters do not feel supported or values. Scotland's firefighters feel abandoned and ignored. And after last week's First Minister's questions, I fear that they will feel more frustrated than ever. Because let's recap, hundreds of firefighters, FBU members and other supporters gathered outside this parliament last week, demanding that MSPs and ministers listen to them, understand and act. But instead, in this chamber, we heard the same predictable spin from the First Minister, when we need honesty because these cuts are costing lives. The reality is £57 million cuts in real term um, since 2012, real term cuts since 2012, 2013, 1,200 firefighter jobs scrapped, response times increased and five control rooms closed and an increasing number of fire appliances that are unavailable. And I'm glad that the firestorm report has been published because it's not the voices of MSPs or ministers, it is the voice of serving FBU Scotland members and I do urge all colleagues to read it because when you read it, it is a, a menu of cuts, lack of recruitment, crisis and retained service, decline in training standards and the necessity of responding to the climate emergency. All of this and more has created the perfect conditions for a devastating firestorm. Like colleagues, I'm here because this is affecting my constituents and my local community now. Uh, Mercedes Vialba talked about Dundee. In my case, uh, Hamilton, where we have lost our temporary appliance, we don't know when we're going to get it back. It's having an impact on crews and their families right now, as Richard Leonard also can speak to. And we've had a devastating fire in East Kilbride recently. That's six homes that have been destroyed. That's six families that have been put at the, the heart of this. Luckily, no lives were lost, but we've heard that the, the cuts have had an impact on response time. So public safety is being compromised. Um, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, presiding officer, is not well equipped to respond to the demands of the climate emergency. Our firefighters need appropriate PPE, equipment and training to tackle wildfires. We need to expand capacity to deal with the predicted increase in flooding incidents. And the capital budget must be increased significantly if the service is to meet the demands of net zero targets. I know that members of the FBU are proud of the work that they do. But are they proud of us? I don't think so. So no ifs, no buts, no more fire service cuts. Thank you very much indeed. And I call on Siobhan Bryan to respond to the debate minister around seven minutes, please. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Let me start by paying tribute to all the firefighters who work hard and play a vital role in keeping our community safe. It is clear from the comments tonight that we are all aware of the important service plays through working in partnership with others and preventing 
and responding to emergencies to improve the safety and the well-being of the people throughout the whole of Scotland. The bravery and the passion of our firefighters has never been in question, and I do not recognise the negative picture of the service that has been painted by others this evening. I am confident that the Scottish Fire Rescue Service has and will continue to deliver the high standard of service to keep our community safe. I would, I'm not, I would like to make a little bit of progress if I can. I've got a lot to address with all the, the debates, all the contributions for tonight, if I may, Presiding Officer. I'd like to turn now to some of the issues raised, starting with the budget. Since 2017 to 18, there has been a substantial year-on-year -year increases in funding to support a modern and effective fire and rescue service. And the budget for 23 to 24, the Scottish Government provided the Scottish Fire Rescue Service with a total of 14.4 million additional funding, bringing the total funding to 368 million this year, despite the challenging financial environment we are currently in due to the UK Government austerity and inflation. It is clear that all our public services have been hit by these inflationary pressures. This has meant that the SFRS has had to look at making efficiencies to deliver a balanced budget. And this is across every single portfolio at the moment. Whilst we have a cash increase in 23 to 24 budget of 1.7 billion, the impact of sustained inflation meant in real terms, the block grant at the time the budget was set was 4.8% lower than it was in 2021 to 2022. The UK government's autumn statement must take more substantive action to increase investment in the services that people rely on and in turn feed into our budget so that we can better align spending and deliver for the people and the organisations across the whole of Scotland. While, while Scotland's public finances are tethered to the decisions of the Westminster government, we will always be working with one hand behind our back. We must balance the budget each year, and we are committed to doing that with all the powers at our disposal to ensure public finances are on a sustainable path. In relation to future budgets, as members know, that will be part of our annual budget. Thanks to continued UK government austerity, these are difficult financial times and money is likely to continue to be tight for the next year. We have limited levers available to us to increase our spending power in the face of the UK government's failure to ensure public spending responds to the real challenges facing everyone's life. We recognise this means taking tough choices to ensure that our resources are focused on the three critical missions outlined in the policy prospectus and driving reform to secure value for money for the taxpayer. The financial position on the capital funding is equally challenging, and I'm sure that we would all like to see the fire service, along with transport infrastructure, schools, prison, hospitals, all receive additional funding. This illustrates the difficult choices that need to be made on the allocation of scarce resources. We have maintained the SFRS capital budget of 32.5 million, and we will continue to strive to provide SFRS with the funding it needs to ensure firefighters have the equipment and the building that they need, buildings that they need to keep safe. Now, if I could turn to pay and firefighter numbers. I'm pleased to say in 20, February 2023, firefighters accept an improved two-year pay offer at 7% for 22 to 23 and 5% for 23 to 24 to run to the end of June 2024. And we are maintaining frontline services with the highest number of firefighters other in the other parts of the UK. At the 31st of March 2022, there are 11.3 firefighters per 10,000 population in Scotland to 6.1 in England and 8.4 in Wales. This Deputy Presiding Officer, a number of members have brought up the issue of the number on location of fire appliances. The number needed to, to keep communities safe, safe is obviously an operational matter for the Scottish Fire Rescue Service, and I, I do hear Richard Leonard's points, but I'm sorry, it would be totally inappropriate for me to get involved with operational. Budget, yes, the Scottish Government. Operational decisions, no. That I am aware that Scottish Fire Rescue has recently withdrawn 10 appliances. It is important to highlight these changes are not all about saving money. By withdrawing appliances in a planned and measured way, the Scottish Fire Rescue Service can ensure full crews are available so more appliances can always be available to keep communities across Scotland safe. 
These operational changes were implemented at the start of September and the Scottish Fire Rescue has provided to MSPs that the operational changes were chosen to minimise the impact on communities. In some areas, as we know, there has been an over provision of resources in comparison with the rest of the country and it is right for the Scottish Fire Rescue to look to deliver on an effective and efficient services that delivers value for money for taxpayers on the public purse. His, ma his chief uh, Majesty's Chief Inspector of Fire and Rescue Service in Scotland has provided independent assurances that these temporary changes are based on a robust analysis of activity level, historical demand and the ability to supplement any initial responses with an acceptable time. So I'd like to give uh, get, uh, to Stuart McMillan and also Mercedes Vialba that I, this morning I was in Aberdeen for the annual performance of the Scottish Fire Rescue where this was uh, a up and they did consult that it would, there would be a full public consultation to any public, any permanent changes. And to Claire Baker, just on your comments regarding uh, is it being reviewed? They are constantly reviewing and I have had insurance from SFRS on the withdrawal of the 10 appliances. It's also important to note that these changes are being made in the context of the fire and fire deaths in all domestic premises, reducing in the last 20 years. Okay, Claire Baker. Claire Baker. Um, thank you very much. Um, while there might be a review taking place, if the review comes back to say, actually, we do need those appliances, are the Scottish Government going to fund that? That's Minister. The operation, it's up, an operation org is, is for Scottish Fire Rescue, not be for the Scottish Government to do it. So they are reviewing it, and they will, in it, the September, after one year, it will go to a public consultation if they Minister, want to. Minister, could you resume review. your seat a second? Sorry? Can I ask you to resume your seat? As all members in this chamber will know, it is up to the member on their feet whether or not they take an intervention. That is not an invitation for other members to start having bilaterals across the chamber. Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I do have a lot to get through, but I do want to say in context of fires and fire deaths in all domestic premises, reducing they have reduced in the last 20 years, and statistics out today show that there were 26,825 fire incidents in 2022 to 23, a decrease of 3.5% on the previous year. There's been an 11.9 decrease in the number of primary fires over the last 10 years, and dwelling fires have been consistently reducing over the last 10 years of the 26 one reduction since 2012 to 2013. Presiding officer, I do want to address some of the members' points. Is that all right? I don't know how I'm going for time. I can give you additional time, yeah. Thank you. Um, just, Katie Clark, if I could just get to you with the, the capital backlog. As I have mentioned, we did protect, um, even though we had a cap flash settlement, we did protect the capital investment this year at 32.5 million, and there's five, five, five fire stations currently being refurbished this year. We will continue to work with Scottish Fire Rescue to identify the capital funding it needs for its building fleet and equipment. Um, Richard Leonard, as I said, it would be inappropriate for me to get involved in operational matters, but the Scottish Government is responsible for the, for the budget. Maggie Chapman, just regarding the FBU Firestorm report, the majority of the points raised in the FBU report, including the allocation of resources, along with the recruitment, retention and training of firefighters, are a matter for the SFRS to consider and address. But we do, after reading the report, there are a lot of uh, issues in the report which the Scottish Government do agree with, such as keeping the community safe, believes that bullying and harassment is always unacceptable. We want to see our firefighters get receive a fair, fair pay. So there's a lot in the report the Scottish Government does uh, believe in. And also Mercedes Vialba. Member did not accept my invitation herself. I've been meeting with MSPs during recess and for the last few months with SFRS. So I extend the invitation again, if you'd like to meet, more than happy to meet you. And I would like to just address Pam Gossel's um, point of getting around Very the table briefly, please. with the FBU. I've met the FBU in June, met the FBU today, met the FBU last week, and I'm meeting them again next month. So it's not an issue of not getting around the table with the FBU, always having discussions with them. So, presiding officer, I will conclude. Scottish Fire Rescue Service is a service that continues to perform well, and I firmly believe that it is in everyone's interest to have an efficient and an effective service. The government will ensure that fire and rescue is a priority now and in the future. So let me finish where I started by commending all those who work in the Scottish Fire Rescue Service and thanking our firefighters for their dedication and work day and night to keep the people and communities safe. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the debate and I close this meeting of Parliament.